Hello everyone, here are videos for civil engineering. Welcome to the channel Amazing Civil Engineering Studies. Here we have different videos on all topic of civil engineering. Please subscribe and press bell icon, like and share as many as possible. In this video, we will come to know about foundation in construction, purpose, and the functions of foundations, types of foundation. What is a foundation in construction? Foundation is the lowest part of the building or the civil structure that is in direct contact with the soil which transfers loads from the structure to the soil safely. Generally, the foundation can be classified into two, namely one. Shallow foundation two. Deep foundation a shallow foundation transfers the load to a stratum present in a shallow depth. The deep foundation transfers the load to a deeper depth below the ground surface. A tall building like a skyscraper or a building constructed on very weak soil requires deep foundation. If the constructed building has the plan to extend vertically in future, then a deep foundation must be suggested. To construct a foundation, trenches are dig deeper into the soil till a hard stratum is reached. To get stronger base foundation concrete is poured into this trench. These trenches are incorporated with reinforcement cage to increase the strength of the foundation. The projected steel rods that are projected outwards act as the bones and must be connected with the substructure above. Once the foundation has been packed correctly the construction of the building can be started. The construction of the foundation can be done with concrete, steel, stones, bricks etc. The material and the type of foundation selected for the desired structure depends on the design loads and the type of underlying soil. The design of the foundation must incorporate different effects of construction on the environment. For example, the digging and piling works done for deep foundation may result in adverse disturbance to the nearby soil and structural foundation. These can sometimes cause the settlement issues of the nearby structure. Such effects have to be studied and taken care of before undergoing such operations. Disposal of the waste material from the operations must be disposed properly. The construction of foundation has to be done to resist the external attack of harmful substances. The foundation for each structure is designed such that the underlying soil below the foundation structure does not undergo shear failure. The settlement caused during the first service load or have to be within the limit. Allowable bearing pressure can be defined as the pressure the soil can withstand without failure. What is the purpose of foundation? Foundations are provided for all load-carrying structure for following purposes. Foundation are the main reason behind the stability of any structure. The stronger is the foundation, more stable is the structure. The proper design and construction of foundations provide a proper surface for the development of the substructure in a proper level and over a firm bed. Specially designed foundation helps in avoiding the lateral movements of the supporting material. A proper foundation distributes load onto the surface of the bed uniformly. This uniform transfer helps in avoiding unequal settlement of the building. Differential settlement is an undesirable building effect. The foundation serves the purpose of completely distributing the load from the structure over a large base area and then to the soil underneath. This load transferred to the soil should be within the allowable bearing capacity of the soil. 
Functions of Foundation in Construction Based on the purposes of foundation in construction, the main functions of the foundation can be enlisted as below. Provide overall lateral stability for the structure. Foundations serve the function of providing a level surface for the construction of substructure. Load distribution is carried out evenly. The load intensity is reduced to be within the safe bearing capacity of the soil. The soil movement effect is resisted and prevented. Scouring and the undermining issues are solved by the construction of foundation. Requirements of a good foundation The design and the construction of a well-performing foundation must possess some basic requirements that must not be ignored. They are the design and the construction of the foundation is done such that it can sustain as well as transmit the dead and the imposed loads to the soil. This transfer has to be carried out without resulting in any form of settlement that can result in any form of stability issues for the structure. Differential settlements can be avoided by having a rigid base for the foundation. These issues are more pronounced in areas where the superimposed loads are not uniform in nature. Based on the soil and area it is recommended to have a deeper foundation so that it can guard any form of damage or distress. These are mainly caused due to the problem of shrinkage and swelling because of temperature changes. The location of the foundation chosen must be an area that is not affected or influenced by future works or factors. Types of foundation for buildings and their uses Foundations are classified as shallow and deep foundations. Types of foundations under shallow and deep foundations for building construction and their uses are discussed. Types of foundation and their uses following are different types of foundations used in construction. Shallow foundation Individual footing or isolated footing Combined footing Strip foundation Raft or mat foundation deep foundation Pile foundation Drilled shafts or caissons Types of shallow foundations One individual footing or isolated footing Individual footing or an isolated footing is the most common type of foundation used for building construction. This foundation is constructed for a single column and also called a pad foundation. The shape of individual footing is square or rectangle and is used when loads from the structure is carried by the columns. Size is calculated based on the load on the column and the safe bearing capacity of soil. Rectangular isolated footing is selected when the foundation experiences moments due to the eccentricity of loads or due to horizontal forces. For example, consider a column with a vertical load of 200 knots and a soft bearing capacity of 100 knots per square meter then the area of the footing required will be 200 slash 100 equals 2 square meters. So, for a square footing, the length and width of the footing will be 1.414 mx 1.414 m. Types of Isolated Footings there are various types of isolated footings such as spread footing, stepped footing, sloped footing etc. They are usually square, rectangular, or circular in shape. Each type of footing is selected based on the soil condition and configuration of imposed loads. Isolated footings are one of the most economical types of footings and are used when columns are spaced at relatively long distances. 
Isolated or single footings are structural elements used to transmit and distribute loads of single columns to the soil without exceeding its bearing capacity, in addition to preventing excessive settlement and providing adequate safety against sliding and overturning. Furthermore, they are used in the case of light column loads, when columns are not closely spaced, and in the case of good homogeneous soil. Types of isolated footings 1. Flat, pad, plain, or reinforced isolated footing. It is constructed under each column independently and is usually square, rectangular, or circular in shape. The thickness of flat isolated footing is uniform. It is provided so as to reduce the bending moments and shearing forces at their critical sections. It can be constructed from plain concrete or reinforced concrete to increase the ultimate load carrying capacity. 2. Sloped Isolated Footing Sloped or trapezoidal footings are designed and executed with utmost attention to maintain a top slope of 45 degrees from all sides. The amount of reinforcement and concrete used in the sloped footing construction is less than that of plain isolated footing. Therefore, it decreases the utilization of concrete and reinforcement. 3. Stepped Isolated Footing Previously, the construction of this type of isolated footing was popular, but its application has declined nowadays. It is generally used in the construction of residential buildings. Stepped footings are stacked upon one another as steps. By and large, three concrete cross sections are stacked upon each other to create steps. Isolated Footing Design Guidelines and Specifications as per IS 456, 2000 Specifications for Design of Footings as per IS 456, 2000 Isolated Footings are designed to sustain the applied loads, moments, and forces and the induced reactions and to ensure that any settlement which may occur is as nearly uniform as possible. And the safe bearing capacity of the soil is not exceeded, CIS 1904. In sloped or stepped footings the effective cross section in compression is limited by the area above the neutral plane and the angle of slope or depth and location of steps is provided such that the design requirements are satisfied at every section. Sloped and stepped footings that are designed as a unit shall be constructed to assure action as a unit. Thickness at the edge of footing 1 In reinforced and plain concrete footings, the thickness at the edge shall be not less than 150 mm for footings on soils, nor less than 300 mm above the tops of piles for footings on piles. 2. In the case of plain concrete pedestals, the angle between the plane passing through the bottom edge of the pedestal and the corresponding junction edge of the column with pedestal and the horizontal plane, see fig. 20, shall be governed by the expression 10 0 F C K plus 1 where 1 Q 0 equals calculated maximum bearing pressure at the base of the pedestal in N slash MM22 F CK equals characteristic strength of concrete at 28 days in N slash MM2. Moments and forces. 1. In the case of footings on piles, computation for moments and shears may be based on the assumption that the reaction from any pile is concentrated at the center of the pile. 
2. For the purpose of computing stresses in footings which support a round or octagonal concrete column or pedestal, the face of the column or pedestal shall be taken as the side of a square inscribed within the perimeter of the round or octagonal column or pedestal. Bending moment The bending moment at any section shall be determined by passing through the section of vertical plane which extends completely across the footing, and computing the moment of the forces acting over the entire area of the footing on one side of the said plane. The greatest bending moment to be used in the design of an isolated concrete footing which supports a column, pedestal, or wall, shall be the moment computed in the manner prescribed above at sections located as follows. a. At the face of the column, pedestal, or wall, for footings supporting a concrete column, pedestal, or wall. b. Halfway between the center line and the edge of the wall, for footings under masonry walls, and c. Halfway between the face of the column or pedestal and the edge of the gusseted base, for footings under gusseted bases. Shear and bond The shear strength of footings is governed by the more severe of the following two conditions. A. The footing acting essentially as a wide beam, with a potential diagonal crack extending in a plane across the entire width. The critical section for this condition shall be assumed as a vertical section located from the face of the column. Pedestal or wall at a distance equal to the effective depth of footing for footings on piles. b. Two-way action of the footing, with potential diagonal cracking along the surface of truncated cone or pyramid around the concentrated load, in this case, the footing shall be designed for shear in accordance with appropriate provisions. In computing the external shear or any section through a footing supported on piles, the entire reaction from any pile of diameter dp whose center is located dp-2 or more outside the section shall be assumed as producing shear on the section. The reaction from any pile whose center is located dp-2 or more inside the section shall be assumed as producing no shear on the section, for intermediate positions of the pile center. The portion of the pile reaction to be assumed as producing shear on the section shall be based on straight line interpolation between full value at dp-2 outside the section and zero value at dp-2 inside the section. The critical section for checking the development length in a footing shall be assumed at the same planes as those described for bending moment and also at all other vertical planes where abrupt changes of section occur. If reinforcement is curtailed, the anchorage requirements shall be checked in accordance with 26.2.3 of IS 456, 2000. Tensile reinforcement The total tensile reinforcement at any section shall provide a moment of resistance at least equal to the bending moment on the section. Total tensile reinforcement shall be distributed across the corresponding resisting section as given below. A. In one-way reinforced footing, the reinforcement extending in each direction shall be distributed uniformly across the full width of the footing. b. In two-way reinforced square footing, the reinforcement extending in each direction shall be distributed uniformly across the full width of the footing, and c. In two-way reinforced rectangular footing, the reinforcement in the long direction shall be distributed uniformly across the full width of the footing. For reinforcement in the short direction, 
a central band equal to the width of the footing shall be marked along the length of the footing and portion of the reinforcement determined in accordance with the equation given below shall be uniformly distributed across the central band. Reinforcement in central band width equals 2 total reinforcement in short direction beta plus 1. Where isolated footing design is the ratio of the long side to the short side of the footing. The remainder of the reinforcement shall be uniformly distributed in the outer portions of the footing. Transfer of load at the base of column. The compressive stress in concrete at the base of a column or pedestal should be considered as being transferred by bearing to the top of the supporting pedestal or footing. The bearing pressure on the loaded area shall not exceed the permissible bearing stress in direct compression multiplied by a value equal to Square root A 1 Square root A 2 but not greater than 2, where a 1 equals supporting area for bearing of footing, which in sloped or stepped footing may be taken as the area of the lower base of the largest frustum of a pyramid or cone contained wholly within the footing and having for its upper base. The area actually loaded and having side slope of 1 vertical to 2 horizontal, and a 2 equals loaded area at the column base. 1 where the permissible bearing stress on the concrete in the supporting or supported member would be exceeded, reinforcement shall be provided for developing the excess force, either by extending the longitudinal bars into the supporting member, or by dowels. 2 where transfer of force is accomplished by reinforcement. The development length of the reinforcement shall be sufficient to transfer the compression or tension to the supporting member in accordance with 26.2 of IS 456, 2000. 3. Extended longitudinal reinforcement or dowels of at least 0.5% of the cross-sectional area of the supported column or pedestal and a minimum of 4 bars shall be provided. Where dowels are used, their diameter shall no exceed the diameter of the column bars by more than 3 mm. Four column bars of diameters larger than 36 mm, in compression only can be doweled at the footings with bars of smaller size of the necessary area. The dowel shall extend into the column a distance equal to the development length of the column bar and into the footing, a distance equal to the development length of the dowel. Nominal reinforcement Minimum reinforcement and spacing shall be as per the requirements of solid slab. The nominal reinforcement for concrete sections of thickness greater than 1 m shall be 360 mm2 per meter length in each direction on each face. This provision does not supersede the requirement of minimum tensile reinforcement based on the depth of the section. Reinforcement Detailing of Isolated Footing Reinforcement detailing of footing is as much important as site investigation for the structural design of footing. A good detailing reflects the design requirement of the footing for structural stability. A good detailing of reinforcement covers topics like cover to reinforcement based on environmental considerations for durability, minimum reinforcement, and bar diameters, proper dimensioning of footing. It is desirable foundation should be detailed in both plan and elevation in drawings. That is why different aspects of reinforcement detailing of isolated footing is discussed in the following sections. Reinforcement detailing of isolated footing include Concrete cover of reinforcements Minimum reinforcement and bar diameter. 
Reinforcement distribution in isolated footing. Dowel reinforcement. Lap splice. One concrete cover of reinforcements according to IS 456 to 200. The minimum thickness to main reinforcement in footing should not be less than 50 mm if footing is in contact with earth surface directly. And 40 mm for external exposed face such as surface leveling PCC. If surface leveling is not used, then it is required to specify a cover of 75 mm to cover uneven surface of excavation. Two minimum reinforcement and bar diameter. Minimum reinforcement shall not be less than 0.12% of the total cross-sectional area. The minimum diameter for main reinforcement should not be less than 10 mm. Three reinforcement distribution in footing. In one-way RCC footing, the reinforcement is distributed uniformly across the full width of footing. In two-way square footings, the reinforcement extending in both directions is distributed uniformly across the full width of the footing. But in the case of two-way rectangular footings, reinforcement is distributed across the full width of footing in long direction. However for short direction, the reinforcement is distributed in the central band as per calculations below. The rest reinforcement in short direction is distributed equally on both sides of the central band. Reinforcement in central band equals 2 total reinforcement in short direction, x, y, plus 1. Where Y is the long side and X is the short side of the footing. For dowel reinforcement. Dowel reinforcement is used to tie the isolated footing to the above column. With regard to dowel reinforcement development length, the development length of dowel bars into the column and the isolated footing shall be provided and clearly shown in the design drawings. See figure. 5 lap splice Splice length of dowel and column reinforcement shall be clearly shown. Anchorage of both flex ural and dowel reinforcement lengths shall be checked to prevent bond failure of the dowels in the footing and to prevent failure of the lap splices between the dowels and the column bars. Combined footing Combined footing is constructed when two or more columns are close enough and their isolated footings overlap each other. It is a combination of isolated footings, but their structural design differs. The shape of this footing is a rectangle and is used when loads from the structure is carried by the columns. Combined footings are provided only when it is absolutely necessary, as one. When two columns are close together, causing overlap of adjacent isolated footings to dot where soil bearing capacity is low, causing overlap of adjacent isolated footings 3. Dot proximity of building line or existing building or sewer, adjacent to a building column. See figure. Figure showing combined footing. Types of combined footing. The combined footing may be rectangular, trapezoidal, or T-shaped in plan. The geometric proportions and shape are so fixed that the centroid of the footing area coincides with the resultant of the column loads. This results in uniform pressure below the entire area of footing. Trapezoidal footing is provided when one column load is much more than the other. As a result, the both projections of footing beyond the faces of the columns will be restricted. Rectangular footing is provided when one of the projections of the footing is restricted or the width of. 
the footing is restricted. Figure showing types of footing. Rectangular combined footing. Longitudinally, the footing acts as an upward loaded beam spanning between columns and cantilevering beyond. Using statics, the shear force and bending moment diagrams in the longitudinal direction are drawn. Moment is checked at the faces of the column. Shear force is critical at distance d from the faces of columns or at the point of contraflexure. Two-way shear is checked under the heavier column. The footing is also subjected to transverse bending and this bending is spread over a transverse strip near the column. Figure showing rectangular footing. Steps for design of combined footing. Locate the point of application of the column loads on the footing. Proportion the footing such that the resultant of loads passes through the center of footing. Compute the area of footing such that the allowable soil pressure is not exceeded. Calculate the shear forces and bending moments at the salient points and hence draw SFD and BMD. Fix the depth of footing from the maximum bending moment. Calculate the transverse bending moment and design the transverse section for depth and reinforcement. Check for anchorage and shear. Check the footing for longitudinal shear and hence design the longitudinal steel. Design the reinforcement for the longitudinal moment and place them in the appropriate positions. Check the development length for longitudinal steel. Curtail the longitudinal bars for economy. Draw and detail the reinforcement. Prepare the bar bending schedule. Note see part 2 of this video for numerical on combined footing. Spread footings or strip footings and wall footings. Spread footings are those whose base is wider than a typical load-bearing wall foundations. The wider base of this footing type spreads the weight from the building structure over more area and provides better stability. Spread footings and wall footings are used for individual columns, walls, and bridge piers where the bearing soil layer is within 3m. 10 feet, from the ground surface. Soil bearing capacity must be sufficient to support the weight of the structure over the base area of the structure. These should not be used on soils where there is any possibility of a ground flow of water above bearing layer of soil which may result in scour or liquefaction. Raft or Mat Foundations Raft or mat foundations are the types of foundation which are spread across the entire area of the building to support heavy structural loads from columns and walls. The use of mat foundation is for columns and walls foundations where the loads from the structure on columns and walls are very high. This is used to prevent differential settlement of individual footings thus designed as a single mat or combined footing. Of all the load-bearing elements of the structure, it is suitable for expansive soils whose bearing capacity is less for the suitability of spread footings and wall footings. Raft foundation is economical when one half area of the structure is covered with individual footings and wall footings are provided. These foundations should not be used where the ground water table is above the bearing surface of the soil. The use of foundation in such conditions may lead to scour and liquefaction. Types of Deep Foundation Six types of deep foundations used in construction and their uses. Deep foundation is required to carry loads from a structure through weak compressible soils or fills onto stronger and less 
compressible soils or rocks at depth, or for functional reasons. Deep foundations are founded too deeply below the finished ground. Surface for their base bearing capacity to be affected by surface conditions, this is usually at depths greater than 3 m below finished ground. Level Deep foundation can be used to transfer the loading to a deeper, more competent strata at depth if unsuitable soils are present. Near the surface Types of deep foundation Basements Buoyancy rafts, hollow box foundations Caissons Cylinders Shaft foundations Pile foundations One basement foundation these are hollow substructures designed to provide working or storage space below ground level. The structural design is governed by their functional requirements rather than from considerations of the most efficient method of resisting external earth and hydrostatic pressures. They are constructed in place in open excavations. Two buoyancy rafts, hollow box foundations. Buoyancy rafts are hollow substructures designed to provide a buoyant or semi-buoyant substructure beneath which the net loading on the soil is reduced to the desired low intensity. Buoyancy rafts can be designed to be sunk as caissons, they can also be constructed in place in open excavations. 3 Caissons Foundations Caissons are hollow substructures designed to be constructed on or near the surface and then sunk as a single unit to their required level. A caisson foundation also called as pier foundation is a watertight retaining structure used as a bridge pier, in the construction of a concrete dam, or for the repair of ships. It is a prefabricated hollow box or cylinder sunk into the ground to some desired depth and then filled with concrete thus forming a foundation. Caisson foundation is most often used in the construction of bridge piers and other structures that require foundation beneath rivers and other bodies of water. This is because caissons can be floated to the job site and sunk into place. Four cylinders. Cylinders are small single cell caissons. Five drilled shaft foundations. Shaft foundations are constructed within deep excavations supported by lining constructed in place and subsequently filled with concrete or other prefabricated load bearing units. A drilled pier is a deep foundation system that uses a large diameter concrete cylinder constructed by placing fresh concrete and reinforcing steel into a drilled shaft. It is also called as a caisson, drilled shaft, cast in drilled hole piles. CIDH piles, or cast in situ piles. For the construction of a drilled pier, a large diameter hole is drilled in the ground and filled with concrete subsequently. The difference between a drilled pier and board pile is basically of the size. Note these deep foundation will be discussed in deep in another video. Part 3 of Foundation Drilled shafts can transfer column loads larger than pile foundations. It is used where the depth of hard strata below ground level is located within 10 m to 100 m, 25 feet to 300 feet. Drilled shafts or caisson foundation is not suitable when deep deposits of soft clays and loose, water-bearing granular soils exist. It is also not suitable for soils where caving formations are difficult to stabilize, Soils made up of boulders, artesian aquifer exists. Six pile foundations. 
Pile foundation is a type of deep foundation which is used to transfer heavy loads from the structure to a hard rock strata much deep below the ground level. Pile foundations are used to transfer heavy loads of structures through columns to hard soil strata which is much below ground level where shallow foundations such as spread footings and mat footings cannot be used. This is also used to prevent uplift of the structure due to lateral loads such as earthquake and wind forces. Pile foundations are generally used for soils where soil conditions near the ground surface is not suitable for heavy loads. The depth of hard rock strata may be 5 m to 50 m, 15 feet to 150 feet, deep from the ground surface. Pile foundation resists the loads from the structure by skin friction and by end bearing. The use of pile foundations also prevents differential settlement of foundations. Selection of pile foundation based on soil condition. The selection of pile foundation depends on the soil investigation data received from soil exploration boreholes at different depths. Selection of appropriate pile for the desired strength and requirement plays an important role in cost reduction and efficiency. In this video, we discuss about the selection of type of piles based on soil conditions. Factors affecting the selection of pile foundation The factors that affect the selection of pile foundations are 1. Soil conditions 2. Loads from structures 3. Nature of loads 4. Number of piles to be used 5. Cost of construction. Types of pile foundation. Depending upon the above mentioned factors, pile are generally categorized into following three types. End bearing piles. Friction bearing piles. Combination of end bearing and friction bearing piles. These has been discussed below. One end bearing pile foundation. End bearing piles also called as point bearing piles are selected when the depth of hard soil strata or bedrock at site is within reasonable depth. The length of pile to be used can be easily computed based on bedrock depth obtained from soil exploration borehole records. In this case, the loads from structures are directly transferred the hard soil through bearing action of pile bottom tip and it does not require the use of skin friction to resist loads. The cost of construction of piles in such cases is optimum. The ultimate capacity of pile or pile group depends on the bearing capacity of bedrock or hard strata. Number of piles to be used in this case depends on the loads from structure and individual capacity of piles. In this case, Q U equals Q P where Q U is the ultimate load capacity of pile foundation Q P is the load carried by the end bearing pile or pile group. In case when the hard bedrock is not available at reasonable depth and fairly compacted hard strata of soil exists, then piles should be extended a few meters into the hard soil strata. 2. Friction Pile Foundation Friction piles resist the loads from structures due its skin friction with soil. This type of pile foundation is selected when a hard stratum is available at large depth and construction of end bearing pile becomes uneconomical. Then number of piles in a group is selected to resist the load from structure through its skin friction. This type of pile foundation also resists loads due to end bearing but its value is small, 
thus it is neglected in calculation. The length of friction pile to be selected in this case depends on the shear strength of soil, loads from structures and size of piles. The capacity of individual pile is calculated based on skin friction resistance provided by selected length of pile. Optimum length of this pile should be used considering economy. The number of piles required in a group can be calculated from individual pile capacity. In this case, Q U equals Q S where Q U is the ultimate load capacity of pile foundation Q. S is the load carried by the friction pile or pile group. The load is transferred to the soil through friction in case of sandy soil and adhesion in case of clayey soil. Loose sand and soft clays may not provide sufficient skin friction or adhesion resistance to heavy loads from structures. Combined End Bearing and Friction Pile Foundation This type of pile foundation is mostly used in construction. The advantage of using this pile is that it can resist loads from structures through both end bearing and friction resistance. This pile has high pile capacity and is economical. This pile is used when the soil exploration results shows hard bedrock or fairly compacted soils at reasonable depth and soil above bedrock supports skin friction resistance. In this case, Q, U, equals Q, S, plus Q, P, where, Q, U, is the ultimate load capacity of pile foundation Q S is the load carried by the friction pile or pile group Q P is the load carried by the end bearing pile or pile group the load is transferred to the soil through friction in case of sandy soil and adhesion in case of clayey soil thank you for watching for now, please subscribe, like, share and do not forget to press bell icon.